Let me introduce all the speakers. So I start with you, uh, Michal. Um, you've been, as we discussed this morning during breakfast, one of the rare scholar to legal scholar to focus on complexity theory, uh, which I would argue, but of course I'm biased, that it is the way of understanding dynamics in the space. You are a professor of law at the Hebrew University, and I'm delighted that you are joining us. So thank you very much for coming and a great contribution on the concept of network of network. Um, next to me, Anouk, uh, doing your PhD at EUI. Uh, we've known each other for quite some years now. Um, you are a competition law expert, um, and you have co-authored a paper with uh, Friso uh, Boston on um, pretty much the two, the, the pros and the cons that we can make as when it comes to in 2024, imposing anti-regulations in the space. Uh, so again, always good to be with you. Uh, and you are also uh, coordinating the network law review. So a big thank you for that. And on my right, uh, Stephen Dines from Surrey University, and only Surrey University. Um, we've also known each other for quite some time now. We had first discussions about public choice theory, which is something that we hope legal scholars will research a little bit more. So I'm looking forward to hear what you have to say on the subject. Uh, you, uh, would you define yourself as a competition law scholar nowadays? Still, all right. But with a, with a very big interest in data and the interplay between competition and privacy. Uh, and this is the theme of your publication for the symposium. So, all right. Introduction's done. Uh, now, I will start in the order on, from the left to the right, and I will give you each three minutes and I'll be very strict, uh, to uh, introduce your contribution to the symposium, uh, what are the main points, and so I'll start with you, Michal. And again, thank you for being here. Okay, so... Um, yeah, you need to wait a couple of seconds. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, thank you, Thibaut Vorgor, for putting this uh, together, this super relevant conference, and also for choosing the perfect timing with the enactment of the AI Act. Um, and for the, org for the hosting institutions as well. Um, this is not in my three minutes, right? <laughs> um, so uh, my piece essentially argues that AI policies should take into account a networks of networks approach, uh, which I'll explain in a minute. Essentially, the interdependencies among different systems and it draws on this branch of physics called networks of networks, which is part of complexity science and uh, focuses on the relations among systems and the specific vulnerabilities that arise as, as a result of those interdependencies among systems. Just to frame this within the broader uh, uh, frame of my research, uh, it's part of my larger interest, as Tiba said, in the interface between law regulation and complex systems. And uh, one of the major insights of this um, branch of research is that interdependencies among networks create specific vulnerabilities and um, largely speaking errors and failures can just percolate from one network to the other network from one system to the other system in this um, in these feedback loops that self that these self amplifying processes so that a small error can magnify and then percolate to many other interconnected systems eventually sometimes leading to catastrophes cascades. There's a very famous example of uh, a power surge in Italy 20 years ago that led to the failure of the internet and the internet was supervising other power um, networks. So the electricity failure aggravated, this in turn aggravated internet failures and so forth. And then eventually it led to the collapse of telecommunication networks, health systems, uh, transportation networks, and financial systems. The entire country was paralyzed for some time. So uh, this is the networks of networks approach. Now coming to AI, because AI systems increasingly interact with other systems, then the networks approach uh, warrants that we uh, should take into account those interactions uh, and that vulnerabilities, failures, errors in AI systems, can, even in systems that do not operate in sensitive or risky fields, can percolate to other systems. And um, the main takeaways of my, contribu my contribution, and maybe we'll talk about this later, 
is first that we should take into account the level of interconnectedness of AI systems in assessing the risk, um, the risk in those systems. So we cannot assess AI systems in isolation according to field. Secondly, that we should adapt this adapted, adaptive dynamic regulation um, towards the entire field of systems, AI systems risk. And thirdly, uh, as far as competition is concerned, the networks of networks approach instructs that highly interconnected hubs increase the vulnerabilities of the systems of systems ecosystem. So this may provide another justification for um, for the calls for less concentration uh, in the AI market. <clears throat> Thanks a lot. So obviously, if you've read the AI Act or the Biden executive order, you would see already differences in the way they approach AI and what you just heard, right? Now, moving on to something which will be more micro, I'm going to give you the floor. Anu can talk about the competition aspect and the reasons why we may or not want to regulate generative AI in 2024 when it comes to having a flourishing market. Um, let me also first thank you very much for organizing this great symposium. Um, both the contributions online as well as the program today look very promising, so thanks a lot. Um, when Frisha and I got together to discuss what we wanted to write about, we started to debate whether to go for a pro or anti-intervention in competition approach. But when you read our contribution, you see that we couldn't really conclude this debate because we made this debate our contribution. Um, so we set out the arguments in favor and uh, against intervention in competition in generative AI. Our conclusion in the end leans more towards um, no intervention yet, uh, given the novelty of the technology. It's still very much evolving as well as the, market, the markets and industries it uh, impacts. And we favor not intervening in this evolution yet. Um, then our contribution is divided into three parts. First, we set the scene because if you want to intervene, you, you need to know where. Um, so in line with the literature, we identify that the technology organizes itself in ecosystems in four layers. The first layer is the AI infrastructure layer, where uh, compute and cloud service providers provide their services, such as the chip maker NVIDIA, um, Amazon Web Services. Then building on that are the, is the second layer, where you find the AI model developers, such as OpenAI and Anthropic. Third are the applications, so the ones that use these AI models and put them into consumer products, such as ChatGPT and Dolly. And then the final layer is the end users. The companies in these layers then integrate into ecosystems. So we see NVIDIA and um, Microsoft Azure are in the top layer. Um, building on that are the AI model developers using their services such as OpenAI, Mistral AI, and Meta. And then the products that are built using those models are ChatGPT, Dolly, Copilot, and GitHub. And you can sort of put a frame around these companies and they're operating in one ecosystem. Then the second and third part of our contribution outline the arguments pro and anti-intervention. But we'll talk about that later in this panel, so um, I will not bore you with that right now. But a bit more about our conclusion. So we see the potential of AI technology to disrupt existing markets. We've explained this as the process of dynamic competition. So we see this industry-wide trend, in this case AI technology, that impacts products in different markets. This then brings next generation products that include these technologies which challenge existing products, um, forcing them to change because if they don't change, they risk losing market shares. And this is the process of dynamic competition. These are effects we think are likely to be seen in hardware, things, smartphones, laptops, digital services like search, but also non-technology products like customer service and travel agencies. All right, so already the way you can connect those two contributions is that <clears throat> if you see the stack as you know being made of different layers let's imagine that there is one app that you use that will rely on the foundation models that for the sake of the argument let's imagine relies on a very poor infrastructure obviously it will be extremely unlikely that customers who want to use a service where every time they prompt the system they need to wait for let's say 10 to 20 minutes because the foundation model is relying not on AWS, but an infrastructure that is, you know, poorly functioning. So this kind of idea of complexity when it comes to those layers is 
already giving us some insights. But if you add to the mix what we may want to do when it comes to data protection, of course it becomes a more, much more complicated story. And this is when I go to you um, uh, for, again, uh, giving us the, the key insights of your contribution. Thank you. So, uh, yes, just what you wanted early on a Friday morning, a symposium on the GDPR. So Article 1 says no. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Um, what I'd like to put forward is actually quite a provocative account. As explained in the paper, and many would disagree with this, I think that the GDPR is fundamentally um, misconceived if it's applied to AI without modification. Now, that's a bold statement. Let me explain it. The reason I'm skeptical is that the existing model of data regulation is based on inputs. The idea of inputs going into systems and therefore consent or a legitimate basis is the two dominant basis for processing in Article 6, if you're keeping notes. But most people in this room probably already know that. Why is this an issue for AI and specifically generative uses? A generative AI system creates a new output. If you limit the inputs, there's a risk of arbitrarily truncating the data within the system and therefore the richness of outputs. But unlike a historic computer system, you know, a Windows 3 computer with the hard drive or the floppy disk, a human could go in and see that data way back when. You still could in your OneDrive or something like that. You could find data and you could read it about people. AI is doing that, but it's a machine that is doing that. And one of the most interesting features which I lay emphasis upon in the paper is that, in fact, there is a category in data regulation of de-identified data which is emerging, sometimes going by the portmanteau pseudonymization. De-identified data would just be information about user one. A common misconception is that these systems have lots of information about John Smith. They don't. They generally have a data point, which may be unique. That's the point of a data point. An insight is meant to be specific, right? But it's not linked to any individual. Unfortunately, the dominant interpretation of GDPR, at least in the EU, is that pseudonymized data in itself is not a safe harbor. It does not allow deregulated processing. And some would say that's the point. But I would challenge that. I would say if it's just happening in a computer and it's not something that you can look at, like your old floppy disk or something, you can't go into it. If it's just the AI doing something by itself, why do you actually care that there's a unique data point in that? The issue is only in the output. But the problem is, as we've seen, particularly with the Italian case, that actually significant innovation can be lost by truncating the data sets, even though they may only be about user one. So there are five case studies um, in this paper. The main theme to them is the difference between risk and hazard-based interpretation of data use. The fundamental submission is that some jurisdictions have adopted a risk-based approach, and that is helpful because I'm not sure what the true case for precaution is for real you know, run-of-the-mill uh, generative AI. There might be some cases for precaution, like healthcare records, but if it's just the creation of a picture or something, looking at the output on an ex post basis may well be fine. If that's true, then a risk-based and not a hazard-based approach would be the sensible way forward. So the five case studies, and then I'll conclude just very briefly. You've got the GDPR itself, which is moving towards more of a risk-based interpretation, a little noted, um, but some important cases. Briar on IP addresses and SRB more recently on identifiers um, does contemplate some risk-based analysis. But more importantly, the CCPA in California is openly risk-based not hazard-based. The major difference with the European approach being that it is based on reasonable risks of identity revelation, not possible risks. Across the channel instead of across the pond, there's the reform to the Data Protection Act in the UK after Brexit. Very significantly, in an undernoted change, the UK will move to a risk-based approach under a current proposal. It's an example of Brexit divergence, 
which will enable competition. Actually, a Brexit benefit, if you want to be honest about it, we're told they don't exist, but this one might actually be real. Finally, two important settlements which really help to flesh this out and show some convergence between the EU and the US, contrary to the commonly held position that the US and the EU fundamentally differ when it comes to data regulation. The first is the settlement with 47 state attorney generals in relation to data handling of geolocation by Google, in which de-identified data is subjected to a transparency standard, user one data, a transparency standard, whereas logged in data, authenticated Google account data, is subject to consents. In other words, de-identified data, user one, is held back from the strictest regulation. And you're maybe thinking, well, that's the sort of thing that would only happen in America, right? Pure risk-based regulation. Well, not quite, because here in Germany, there's a settlement with Google, which actually takes a similar approach. It strongly regulates aspects of personal data, but not de-identified data to the same extent. So my submission is actually there is convergence, contrary to the commonly held view, which is converging on a risk-based approach, which would then enable more competition in AI from more vendors. All right, <clears throat> thanks very much. So now we move on to part one of the conversation, which again is dedicated to mapping the main regulatory issues. Um, and something that I've seen in the crypto world, and I'm sure this is coming in AI, is that when we talk about regulation, all we, we tend to think about is what the policymakers is doing or are doing, but we tend not to have a look at court decision as regulations, but I think we should because indeed they may define the dynamics in the space. So if I go back to, to you, Stephen, immediately, um, how do you think the enforcement of data rights in a scenario where generative AI indeed blurs the line between the content that is original and the content that is AI generated will play out. And I mean, of course, I can't ask you to make a prediction as to what the court will say, but could you at least, depending on the, how they may approach the subject, think of how this will impact competitive dynamics? And again, three minutes maximum to answer this very complicated question. Okay, well, thank you. So, yes, you'll, you'll all be uh, hearing too much from me, I guess, on this topic. But I am really, really passionate about making sure that this is a risk-based approach, not a hazard-based approach. So what could the courts do here? There is a lot of ambiguity, particularly in the GDPR itself. I don't want to harp on too much about it. But there are conflicting articles in it about what the safeguards need to be to allow deregulated, decentralized processing. I think it's quite helpful to take a step back in what can be a very, very technical discussion, which can be a little off-putting and excluding if you're not careful. Taking a step back, what would you want? Well, you wouldn't want to regulate anything unless there is harm. And this is a fundamental challenge for the privacy scholars. I'm not really a privacy scholar. I got into this through competition and looking at how these restraints affect online businesses. If you're a privacy scholar, they actually have said on the record, well, it's a very broad law and that's a very good thing. A totally unprincipled statement. I'll be polite enough not to attribute that. It is attributed in the paper. Um, but the, um, the, the point here is one should only regulate where there is actually a concrete risk of harm. Right? Why, why is there regulation of something where there is not a risk of harm? Well, the argument is often it's a fundamental right, but fundamental right on what? You don't have a fundamental right on the data from people who sell bottles. You don't have a fundamental right on the people who make glasses. You have a fundamental right on information about you. That's the distinctive characteristic justifying regulation. It follows that if an AI system is just processing information about bottles and glasses, there's no regulation on that. It's the identity linking that is the principal basis for differentiated privacy regulation. But the problem is the courts have taken, to your question, a precautionary approach. Well, it's possible someone touched this bottle, so it might be personal data. That's a very silly position. So that's what the courts ought to reject, in my opinion. All right. And of course, I'm reminded that, as you will see throughout the day, some of the issues that we are discussing on this panel will be also discussed on all the panels which is designed on purpose because you can't think of those issues in silos, right? Um, now, if I take a step back and go to you, Anouk, you do indeed in the paper mention the pros and the cons of ex-ante regulations. Um, 
if I had to ask for the best argument in favor of intervening right now in 2024 or not, what would it be? So I think the best argument why we need to intervene now is very much in line with the regulatory landscape. The, the, the position that is being taken towards big tech is that we're scared or that regulators are scared that generative AI will strengthen existing market positions further and that history will repeat itself and that in the end we'll be stuck with a few or one dominant firm dominating the, the technology. So in line with this, the argument in favor of ex ante regulation would be that you can avoid or prevent potential monopoly and you can shape the market in a more competitive way. The main argument against this would be that you're regulating a very much evolving technology and the applications are still evolving and the impacts on the markets and industries are still evolving and it may disrupt some markets and which is good because we have a concentrated big tech. Um, so then if it can disrupt these markets, maybe you shouldn't intervene in this process of dynamic competition where you eventually reduce or limit innovation and benefits for consumers. Okay, so trying to make a connection between what we've heard from Stephen and the point you're making here. Uh, we do hear already from competition agencies that they, do, they want a perfect competition market with as many players as possible. My view is that if that's how we measure success in the space, we will have failure because you have increasing returns and it's going to go to an oligopoly. But looking at not competitive dynamics per se, but a, what I hear, you know, a, a little melody that I hear now, which is that we would need diversity in the space if only for the fact that foundation models are trained in a certain way. And if you were to have just one, it will give you one view of the world as opposed to having the possibility of using, you know, the one developed by Elon Musk that may give you a certain view of the world, the one developed by Google. We've heard example and seen example of Gemini two weeks ago where, you know, it was leaning towards one political side of the spectrum. So do you think that competition agencies should indeed have, you know, those objectives that you could describe as being external to competition and push for diversity in the market, if only for the sake of having this, you know, possibility of using LLMs without, without just one imposed view of the world? Yeah, I think that diversity in competitors would be a very good goal to pursue. If, if the regulation were just to pursue competition, a counter argument would be you see competition. Um, I would argue that you see competition between ecosystems, within the ecosystems. But maybe we prefer to see a certain type of competition, which is a competition that is also driven by smaller firms. I mean, the, the significantly successful, the first significantly successful Gen AI application didn't come from Google, Meta, Amazon. It came from a previously unknown startup called OpenAI, and it's still the best chatbot that we that we use. Um, it's still the most popular one, despite these big tech coming in, Google coming with BART, and Microsoft coming with Copilot. Um, so I think that a diversity in, in competitors would be a good goal to pursue. Right, so um, now if we go to the regulations that we have, and let's try to discuss indeed if the AI Act is pushing in the direction of having that diversity or not, uh, we know from GDPR that it was extremely good to some of the big tech companies for two reasons. The first, they could afford to comply with GDPR at a cost that is proportionally smaller than for small companies. And we have a paper actually published just a couple of weeks ago in the NBER showing that because of GDPR, EU companies are processing 26% less data than what other companies may do in other parts of the world. So GDPR has an impact on competitive dynamics, which doesn't mean that we do not want GDPR, maybe this is, you know, one of the downsides of GDPR, and yet it is essential that we have it. I'm not here to discuss that, but GDPR had an impact. If I now go to you, Michal, and try to see if the AI Act may have such an impact, so what we have in the AI Act that it says, those are high-risk um, 
categories of AI systems depending on where AI is deployed. And if you try to deploy it in health, then you have to comply with all of those provisions. But the point you are making is that this misses at least some issues because we do not look at the, how AI is being interconnected with other systems. So the question is this, um, how do you wish that regulators will approach AI risk? And could you try to factor in your answer this idea of making sure that we do not come up with one regulation that is so complex and so complicated that only one company could afford to comply with it. May I first follow up on your exchange with Anouk about the diversity of worldviews? Uh, so I am very concerned that we would be losing diversity in the sense of cultural diversity, historical diversity in the world of LLMs because um, both the training materials are mostly the same uh, Anglo-American training materials and also the technological paradigm pushes towards the mainstream, the popular, because it's based on f a statistical frequency. So um, I am in, involved in a, a research where we are working with eight different language models and we are trying to see whether we can um, uh, achieve more diversity by using several models and indeed each model has a slightly different view of the world. So I think, um, the, f to me at least, this is um, an important consideration well, f for, for diversifying the market for models. Um, as for your question, um, the AI Act. Um, so I am concerned about, uh, concerned and skeptical about um, the AI Act's attempt to identify risks solely by the subject matter or the field in which the systems operate, like health and education and uh, um, uh, affecting fundamental rights, et cetera, et cetera, because the networks of networks approach implies that we cannot isolate risky fields. Um, so, um, and there's no um, factor of interconnectedness or connectivity in assessing the risk under the AI Act, not under Article 7, not in the Annex. Uh, so I think this iso isolated, uh, isolating approach uh, is at least uh, doubtful. Uh, similarly, we, can, we have now in the AI Act the concept of uh, systemic risk in Article 3, um, but systemic risk, again, requires this negative effect on public health or safety that will be reasonably foreseeable. And, be, and we have to understand the networks of networks approach really makes it very clear that we are regulating here under deep uncertainty because those um, cascades, catastrophes, large failures can start with really, really small errors that would magnify themselves in this self-amplifying process. So, and the ability to anticipate this in advance, how things will unfold is, um, is very doubtful, in my view, non-existent. So the um, two main directions that I see is, first of all, looking at the level of connectivity as a risk factor. Even an LLM that is not operating in a risky field, in a sensitive field, but has lots of connections to the internet, to search engines, to email systems, uh, could be risky, if, perhaps even more than an AI system that operates in a risky field, but is completely closed. So this is uh, one factor. And secondly, I think this unpredictability uh, implies that we need to take this um, humble and dynamic regulatory approach. Instead of trying to anticipate each and every contingency in advance, the, the regulation should be adaptable, should be uh, monitoring what's going on, how, how things are playing out. And I think in this aspect, the AI Act is doing better. Uh, there is infrastructure for updating the uh, Annex 3, the high-risk uh, systems. There is infrastructure for uh, gathering information from the industry, for um, uh, integrating it, for post-market monitoring, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, I'm hopeful uh, that this will play out and the regulation will indeed um, be dynamic and adaptable. So on that, I would agree that the Act is doing better than, let's say, the DMA or the DSA in a sense that it could be adapted, we could have more systems being considered high risk. Uh, what is not possible though in the AI Act is if we realize that one of the provisions imposed on a high risk system is ineffective or counterproductive, we cannot get rid of it, right? So it is adaptable, but only to a certain degree. But 
something, you use the words which uh, I, I would share, which is the one of being concerned when it comes to the AI Act. The reason why I'm concerned is that the AI Act tries to be tech neutral, and I think precisely for that reason is not neutral. I'll give you one concrete example. It says that regardless of how AI function, and you can see in the appendix that definition is very broad. It could be machine learning, obviously, but also expert systems or user statistics. Regardless of that, if you deploy AI in a high-risk sector, you have to comply with the same provisions. And I think it makes no sense because if you mitigate some of the risk using an expert system where you know what are the possible outputs, you are not creating the same risk as using unsupervised machine learning where the output is unknown to you. But coming back to your contribution uh, and the fact that you are concerned about the AI Act, now that we have it and that we can't change it anymore, what's the, what's the worst case scenario? So what do you think we're going to have in Europe because we ignored the complexity and interconnection of AI with other systems? So, um, you know, uh, true to my view that nothing is really predictable here or completely predictable, uh, I can only say that uh, the, the general problem we face, if we ignore um, complexity, not in the sense of something complicated, but in the sense of complex system, system science, the science that uh, explores how complex systems behave, uh, which rules govern their development, their growth. Uh, so if we ignore this entire body of science when we regulate, and this is not just the AI Act, but in general, uh, the we would be basing our regulation not on the world as it is, but on some hypothetical, um, less realistic view of the world, and we can end up with regulation that is less effective and uh, definitely more costly. Um, so to be more concrete, if we ignore the dynamics of interactions among systems, um, and we regard systems in isolation, then we could be witnessing cascading dynamics, and by the time we realize, and due to this exponential nature of those cascades, by the time we locate a um, big failure in uh, critical in infrastructure, it may be too late or very, very costly to, to deal with. Uh, whereas, if we adapt a more networked uh, state of mind, then we may be able to uh, prevent those errors and failures at the source level. Um, so I think this is the main risk, and we may be adding some risk to our critical infrastructure. All right, so now you will hear later on today from non-academics, but as academics, you are expecting us to be quite good, I guess, at asking the right questions, but very bad at answering those questions. And that's precisely what I want us to do now. Moving on to ideas or concrete proposals as to how we can address some of those challenges. So that's part two of the discussion. Um, and I'll start with you, Anouk. So you've mentioned, you know, the pros and the cons of intervening today when it comes to just protecting competition in the space, which is already a big objective. The question is this, and I guess we should start there. Which indicators should policymakers and us academics collect so that we know when is the time to intervene and, you know, as Stephen mentioned that, well, without a market failure, what would, what, would, what would you intervene in the first place? So which kind of metrics and variables would you wish we can collect to identify that there is a market failure and that the time has come to intervene? Yeah, it's a question that very naturally comes to mind when you read your contribution because we end on this note that we shouldn't intervene yet, but we didn't have the words to, to expand on this, so I'm very happy you asked. Um, so... As I said before, I think that, that it's very important to realize that important contributions to the innovative system of generative AI comes from smaller firms. So to keep the industry competitive, we need to look for, or we need to protect competition coming from smaller firms. So the first important indicator that it's not as competitive as we would like it to be would be access restrictions. So access is crucial for smaller firms. Um, they need to have access to uh, cloud services, they need da data, they need access to models. Um, so if there's any sign of access restrictions, be it foreclosure, unfair um, requirements to gain access, or a tilting trend towards closed source models, that would be the first indicator that intervention may be needed. Second, a slowdown in evolution. Um, so now we see new highlights of 
generative AI, there's new news every day. I, I receive a newsletter with generative AI news on a daily basis. So even in the infrastructure layer, which is the most concentrated layer, if these highlights are fading or slowing down, that would also be an indicator that we have a less competitive environment and that maybe we need to intervene. And this can also be due to the first indicator that there are access restrictions. And third and final, when we see that these access restrictions escape antitrust law. Um, for example, in Europe, for an abuse of dominance, you need to have a dominant position, but the technology, at least if you were to ask me, doesn't seem to develop in that direction. Um, maybe at most we'll have an oligopoly in the infrastructure layer. So if, if antitrust doesn't catch the access restrictions, we need to intervene. <clears throat> so, you know, you mentioned escaping antitrust. This is a subject that is at the heart of competition agencies. You may have seen that Microsoft, quote unquote, acquired a company this week by hiring all of the employees and not the, the company itself. I think antitrust is flexible enough to actually capture that. If you look at the EU merger regulation, you can make a point that it falls under the scope of merger control, but Generative AI is asking those questions as to how can you push the boundaries of antitrust. Uh, and we know that the European Commission, at the very least, is willing to intervene when it comes to exclusionary practices, meaning practices eliminating competitors and putting the competitor out of the market, but also exploitative abuses, right? So if as a company you can access to cloud or compute, but at a very high cost, this could also trigger some antitrust intervention. I go back to you, Michal, now. Um, so let's say that on the one hand we have enforcers very flexible because they follow what Anouk you know, just explained. And they have all of those indicators, they can screen them, scrape the data, and intervene when necessary. On the other end, we have the regulators, the policymakers. As I've mentioned, the AI Act now is not final. You can all download the final version of it, which is great for research. Um, but how, what would you do? And that kind of relates to my bonus question, you'll see. Um, but in, in the face or considering the network of network approach, Let's say that, let's look at just the EU for now. What can we do now that we have the AI Act? Sh should we try to change it eventually? Should we in introduce a new kind of regulation that okay. will you know, be in this, in this kind of complexity mindset? Okay, so it's true that the level of connectivity or interconnectedness is, is not there in the definition of risk under the AI Act. Although, you know, I come from a common law system, so I can think of a very creative interpretation of the Act that would take into account levels of interconnectedness. The Act does, does um, speak about uh, interactions with other AI systems, so possibly we could sort of uh, interpret this as uh, referring to interactions with other systems in general, or even um, interpret the term uh, risk in a way that takes into account interconnectedness without changing the act, but this is pro possibly only my common law you know, mindset. Um, also, uh, and I think you were possibly alluding to that, uh, there's, there has to be some iterative uh, uh, process uh, and uh, communi communication between all stakeholders involved, obviously. And there is, in, and here I do, um, I am optimistic about the AI Act. Um, the private sector, the academia, the uh, stakeholders, the producers, the developers of the models uh, should all be part of the conversation. Um, similar to what the conversation we're having here. I think this is also um, helpful. Um, and the Act has the, the infrastructure for that, and there are explicit provisions that uh, um, uh, provide that uh, the policymakers should consult with the industry in assessing uh, robustness, in assessing accuracy, in uh, uh, devising um, um, uh, these uh, uh, codes of conduct. So. Uh, if this uh, conversation is, is, takes place and plays out as it should, then I think uh, the, um, possibly it would be clearer as things unfold, when is the time to intervene and, and what should be done in specific context. Right, so I, I mentioned a paper about GDPR and the question will be for you, Stephen. Here's the reference. Data, privacy laws and firm production 
evidence from GDPR, and those are the specific numbers. Because of GDPR, EU firms decreased data storage by 26% and data processing by 15% relative to comparable US firms, becoming therefore less data intensive. I guess the question is this, and I, I don't want to give the impression that because of that, we should have no privacy regulation at all because it may sometimes, you know, come at the cost of a trade-off with competition dynamics. But what's interesting in the uh, Act, and I guess I could make a point that this is really much the first time the EU is trying to balance innovation market dynamics on the one hand and fundamental rights on the others. There is a bit of that in the DMA, a bit of that in the DSA, but in the uh, Act, it's very clear that the policymaker is trying to balance those two and it's extremely hard. How can we do it? So how can we make sure that we have some sort of data protection, privacy, when it comes to the Gen AI ecosystem, while at the same time, not entirely killing all the dynamics because innovation will also bring more privacy eventually. So yes, how, how to fix uh, Web3 use of data in three minutes. So uh, let me try. Um, you're right, the statistics in the paper are interesting. So a 26% drop in storage and a 15% drop in processing. Of course, if you're an adherent to the view that the processing might be harmful, then actually that's the point, right? You want less processing if you want a regulated use. That's the point of regulating. I would say percent of what? You know, these are very interesting papers, but um, it is clear that there's a consensus emerging in the papers. So, you know, the February paper, the other one that comes to mind is um, Garrett Johnson's um, survey review, also with NBER, where he goes through the different, um, different contributions. And it is fairly clear at this point that there is a strong correlation between the implementation of the GDPR, the restriction in the data handling, the increase in costs, and decreased innovation. A really good example is de decreases in free apps, which from a consumer welfare perspective is just anti-consumer. However, what some of these apps do might be considered to be anti-privacy. For example, you go into the grocery store and you get an advert based on your geolocation. Doesn't bother me. I don't mind a pastor advert. But there are people who do object to this use case. So to me, this is about transparency to the consumer, maybe less so than control, so that the consumer who is concerned can decline to participate. How does that relate to the AI Act? Well, you'd want to think about the real use cases, not generalizations. You'd want to think about whether there are proportionate approaches which would allow some data-driven industries to flourish while still allowing, for example, transparency to the user who doesn't want the pasture advert. And that is a difficult path, but it's also the path not being taken. Um, part of the issue with the GDPR is I think it is fair to say that there aren't many examples of EU law finding a reverse gear. If GDPR was an overreach, which is what the stats may be telling us, where's the reverse gear? It's, it, you know, it's a very striking contrast to me with um, the US experience with deregulation, particularly back in the 80s, where there definitely was a reverse gear on regulation. Maybe the AI Act is the way to fix that. Well, a bit late to your point, but uh, interpretation of it on a more evidence-based approach would be helpful. So in a nutshell, I would love to see courts and enforcers taking a divergent set of approaches so that there would be competition between them and there would be natural experiments in what works best. Yeah, and what's interesting is that in the recital of the AI Act, the EU Commission is telling us that they are going for some sort of uniformity in the EU, which of course I would argue is a big reason why we don't have such a flourishing market. The EU single market does not really exist. You need to comply with all sorts of regulations. I mean, we are here in Germany. There is German version of the DMA now. So, you know, something more for companies. On the other hand, if you have a rule for all the EU, but you do not like the rule, then you're stuck with it, right? So some competition amongst the policymakers may maybe the solution. So I go back now to you, Anouk. One, one answer or one possible solution could be that instead of saying I'm going to regulate everything AI, I'm just going to intervene in a very specific sector. Or you could even go a step further and say I'm going to do it DMA-like, which is I only regulate certain companies such as we are as well in the DSA. What's interesting is that the GDPR applied to all companies DSA DMA only applies to specific companies, and the AI Act is coming back to this idea of re-regulate all companies as long as it's high risk, etc. 
do you see that as a potential solution? So narrowing down the regulation, or do you think that on the contrary, it's better to have a rule that applies to all companies because at least it provides some sort of legal certainty? Yeah, this is sort of a yes or no question. Um, I think I'm going to take it a bit more broad and, and think a bit more about the pros and cons. Um, because, of course, a sector-specific regulation for AI, you can really make it, you can tailor it to the sector that AI is used in. Um, so it would be more precise, but I think there's a big risk there because you need to understand the technology and the market dynamics really, really well. Um, and it's not without reason that the DMA only applies to technologies that have been around for, for quite some time. Um, I'm going to quote Scott Martin now, who said, the DMA only applies to fairly old technologies like search and operating systems and social networks that have been around for 15 years or more. So we understand them reasonably well, end of quote. And I think for generative AI, we are not there yet. So a sector-specific regulation in that regard may be difficult. And we also need to know which sectors we have to regulate. Um, and this is difficult in light of user innovation, um, which relates to Jason Pot's contribution. We do not know yet in which sectors generative AI will feature because we will have users that will find innovative and unanticipated ways or, or sectors to apply um, generative AI in. So it's difficult to now come up with a comprehensive sector specific regulation. Um, this may be a benefit for a more generalized regulatory approach that it can also cover these unanticipated uses. But the big risk there is that, of course, the technology is taken as something that is applied in similar ways across industries, sectors, which will not be the case. Um, think of it as a, a computer act. We cannot come up with a computer act that regulates everything related to computers um, in one single specific act that would be extremely difficult, if not impossible. So for that, a more sector-specific regulation would be beneficial. And indeed, like you said, you can target specific companies, probably the ones that cause concerns. And you can relieve the smaller firms so they can invest all resources in innovation. So I do think that in the end, sector-specific regulation may be better, but first we need to really understand the technology, the market dynamics, and which sectors are going to be most problematic. So, in one contribution to the symposium by Axel Voss, a member of the European Parliament, he pushed and when negotiating the AI Act for more innovation-friendly provisions. But I do think you just gave an idea to the EU policymakers, the Computer Act. If this was introduced tomorrow, I wouldn't be too surprised, actually. Um, something that I stole from Mark Anderson is uh, an analogy with AI and electricity, not that, I, would, I won't make the point that this is as important as electricity, I do not know. But what's clear is that when electricity was invented, no one at the time could foresee that one day, one person will come up with the electric guitar, right? And yet, one follows the other. Probably the same for Gen AI. So that makes it very complicated to, to regulate and intervene. And so one solution, and Michal, you've mentioned that already, would be to have a closer partnership between public and public authorities and the companies operating in the space. Now, of course, when you hear that, you also hear regulatory capture. And we've seen that already OpenAI is quite active in US Congress in trying to push for regulation because they can afford to comply with that regulation. So how do you think this, this could work for the best, this kind of partnership between public and private? You know, regulatory capture, as, as, as you know better than me, is a general problem. It's not unique to AI. So we need to uh, use the lessons from the past. And uh, I, I do see in the AI Act specific provisions like post-market monitoring, provisions um, imposing duties on providers to uh, inform about serious incidents, uh, inform the, the uh, authorities. Um, so, so there are. So it's a mixture, I believe, between those mandates and um, and conversation. And uh, um, so, so the um, stakeholders are not free of obligations, not at all. But on the other hand, the regulator is 
open enough, sufficiently open to um, evaluate what's going on on the ground, to gather information and then to respond. So I think this, this would be the best um, scenario. And um, if I may follow up on, on, on something you said earlier about the courts, it's true that the regulation is not just the act, it's also the courts. And here I, I think we can make a useful distinction between um, individual harms or risks from AI and systemic risks. Like when the risk or the harm is to an individual or a firm, like from as a result of um, uh, privacy infringement or copyright infringement or even physical injury from, I don't know, uh, uh, autonomous cars, then this will get eventually to the courts. And then we will have some sort of decisions, levels of liability, uh, the law will become clearer. But when the harm is systemic, like from, uh, as, as, as Elizabeth described, misinformation, uh, deep fakes that do not use a, a person, a specific person, a real person that can sue. Um, no one will file a lawsuit because, because AI claims that the earth is flat. But we know from our experience in social media that in the aggregate, these systemic things can really cause severe social harms. And I think as researchers, as regulators, um, we need to f try and identify these systemic harms, which can go under the radar and then become a huge problem. Um. Yeah, and that's maybe a role for researchers, right? To try to create a maybe open public database where we have identified all of Absolutely. those risks. All right, so I'm here trying to explore all possibilities. So sector-specific regulation, maybe public-private partnership. Now moving on to you, and that's something you alluded to already. Um, you may you may want to have some competition in terms of you know uh, legal environments. On the other end, I could also see how some sort of international cooperation is needed in the space, um, because if not, it may be that all companies would just move to the jurisdiction that is best for their interests at the expense of you know some of our EU fundamental rights. So what do you make of that? How do you see international cooperation working in the space? So again, if you could just press a button and make it work you know, in a uh, public choice friendly manner, what would you do? So uh, a very interesting question, thank you. You know, I used to be um, more sort of depressed about this topic because I thought that the so-called Brussels effect would just be overwhelming. I do think there is a problem with Brussels' claim to legitimacy having passed the GDPR and with some of the problems seen with it, with its highly precautionary approach without any particularly clear evidence base to support that position. Unlike other notable um, precautionary use cases, it's not clear what it is in the case of a low-risk data point. Why all this precaution? I was worried that the world would just get steamrolled by it, but happy to say that hasn't happened in fact, the trend is the other way, and this is the point that isn't as well known about the GDPR interpretation. Um, in particular, following the SRB case concerning some data handling by Deloitte, there is language in that decision from the EU courts which is taking a more risk-based approach. You've got the development in the UK where some competition is emerging with the Brussels approach, but much more significantly, there's the German settlement I mentioned, which seems to align with the risk-based approach of the US Attorney General settlement. So it may well be that there are principles for convergence. It doesn't need to be a race to the bottom. What is unhelpful, though, is when you get that, I mean, maybe this is a bit unfair, but there is that kind of EU Commission mindset that, no, there must be one rule, there must be one rule. We can't have divergence, there must be one rule, with very little sensitivity to the point that sometimes a degree of divergence is healthy. A degree of divergence creates competition. A degree of convergence is freeing. Decentralization drove Web 1 and Web 2 innovation. Why not let it drive Web 3, right? These are slightly generalizations. To be more concrete, there is actually a precedent, which is the important work of the ICN in relation to competition law. So this will be very familiar to this audience, right? Um, in theory, if you have merger control diverging around the world, the longest pole in the tent could determine business strategy, at least for major jurisdictions, based on just one country saying, oh, let's mandate access on an unprincipled basis, you know, industrial policy abuse of competition law, in other words. And the ICN did all of this wonderful quiet work in the background to say, well, hang on a minute, 
as a group of enforcers, are we sure that's what we really want? Don't we want an evidence-based approach? Now that I perceive as a gap at the moment in the AI space. There's all this focus on passing the laws. The next big thing will be things like guidance drafts. And at that point, the soft law coordination will be really important when people get together and say, well, we might have differences in the letters of our law here and there, but we can align on basic principles which respect rights, but also allow innovation. Of course, that's evading your question, but I don't have a magic wand. All right, I'm gonna take questions from the floor before moving on to what I think may be actually just, not just one bonus question, but two, because I just thought of an extra one. Yeah, Paul, you have a question, right? Uh, this is a question for Anouk. I, I'm just wondering why you don't include in the ecosystem the manufacture of uh, chips, particularly in, by TSMC, because, I mean, if anybody is uh, sitting on a bottleneck, they are. And the issues about access to that bottleneck clearly are world geostrategic issues um, and have a lot to do with what we think China is going to get up to in the next, um, in the next decade. So I, I just wonder why you left that out. So maybe I was not clear, but I did mean to include it in the AI infrastructure where I wanted to include chip makers and cloud service providers, if that answers your question. not the same and would not have the same kind of solutions as TSMCs. So I just wonder whether you have any thoughts about how we should think about that. I mean, for example, you know, is the Biden's confrontational approach to supply of chips to China uh, possibly not self-defeating in the medium to long run? Because if China sees it has no stake in the kind of things that TSMC produces, because it's not going to get them anyway, um, it, you may risk bringing about the very... Um, a conflagration that you want to avoid? I don't have an answer to, to this, but it's a very good point, and um, I will definitely look into this more. Thanks. Thank you very much. May we very quickly follow up on this, and maybe Anouk again, just following up. Um, are you aware of this AI innovation package that was launched in January, and the concept of AI factories? Okay. Because that's, I think, one initiative that you just launched in order to, I think I quote here, um, to bring together the necessary ingredients, computer power, data, and talent to create cutting-edge generative AI models, especially focusing on um, SMEs and startups. So that would be something to consider as well. Who's next? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, well, I wanted to follow up on the distinction between risk-based and hazard-based uh, approaches and and I'm very sympathetic or I'm very aligned with your argument that we should just shift more toward thinking about outputs and uh, that we we are creating some harms with uh, just kind of this very rigid approach of data minimization and and uh, not distinguishing between um, identifiable and de uh data, but I wanted to ask you if there are differences in your mind between um, pseudonymity, de-identification, de -identification, um, whether you would want more laws um, that are kind of proactive or more regulatory experimentation that um, thinks about uh, synthetic data, that thinks about um, all kinds of ways to actually accelerate the collection of data. That's, it's part of my argument, so I wanted to hear your uh, ideas about this, that um, I've argued, and you know, maybe you have a reaction to this, that we even don't have language in the GDPR and in the new EUA Act and you know, in, in, in the Biden executive order of how to positively use AI to um, complete missing data sets and to create more representative, fuller knowledge. And, and it is because we have this skewed idea that you described really well um, that we've always kind of been about 
you know, the the hazards, the precautionary idea of collecting, you know, the, the inputs. Thank you. It's a fantastic question and, uh, you know, really very thought-provoking. I do think that innovation can balance competition and privacy. That's a really important point. And it's done by attention to specific use cases, as you note. So yes, as you drill down, getting into the small language models, the innovation using things like AI data points. One of the most interesting things, though, in that context, I find, is that the original reason for the hazard-based approach is, is traced back sometimes to this early paper, the, the Sweeney paper, which I mentioned a bit in, in, in the paper for this conference, which is based on the idea that uniqueness can itself be a problem. And it seemed like in the interpretation of that paper subsequent that basically the uniqueness becomes perceived to be the problem as opposed to problematic uniqueness. And that was a really significant error in my view, actually a category error, which isn't a light thing to say, but I would stand by it because it could be that you've got a data point. She uses in the paper famously the governor of Massachusetts. Well, okay, you have a data point which is unique to the governor of Massachusetts, but what data is this? Is it that it's the governor of Massachusetts or is it that the governor of Massachusetts is doing something that they wouldn't want you to know? Those are actually two different things and it would be the matching of the private data to the fact that it's the governor of Massachusetts that actually drives the problem. It isn't the unique data point that there is a governor of Massachusetts. And that may have been so obvious to Sweeney that she didn't put much emphasis on it, understandably, but it is very significant. Because if you then say, oh, there must be anonymity at the level of at least k equals two, k equals three in the jargon, then you lose uniqueness from data sets. And that would actually limit things like synthetic and small data models because k equals one, the unique data point, may be very helpful to models which are less invasive. To make it more concrete, there's a very good example um, in relation to browsers at the moment. You may have noticed that the um, UK CMA, the EU Commission, they're looking at the browser as a data handler. And some of the big tech proposals, which are arguably based on things like the Sweeney Insight, that there should be a restriction of data so that the data only arises at the non-unique level. But that's a major limitation. If it's set as a principle, that's a major limitation to AI because a small company can't use K equals one data, unique data points, just because Google or Apple is saying that's not private on no substantiated basis. If you let that principle go, small companies who want to use unique data points, which may be very good and reasonable things that may move data towards more responsible and careful use out of the large um, Googleplex, out of the large Apple, out of Meta, the competition towards more responsible approaches, it's just not being explored. These are actually questions for research. Is it better to have a small fringe of compliant players or Meta? It, it could be either, right? We don't know as of today, but there's this assumption that people have to control data, that that means that you can't have unique data points, which is really a truncation of the argument. Thank you for the question. Um, um, it's a great uh, discussion, and I have a question for you, but perhaps also broader. Uh, you discussed a lot about regulation, Alexander, and... Um, now, from my perspective, um, if there's such a huge uh, now innovation as generative AI with so many uh, not even predictable uh, uh, development from that, I think it's very clear that the rules of the system and the legal rules and regulations have to change somehow. And I think these are two different questions. One is we already have rules and regulations. And the question is whether they fit still now the new technology, and I think there's a discussion also about GDPR, but it's also a discussion about copyright law and about IP law. Yeah, this is, and the other question is about that there might be now the technology will lead to problems and new problems which cannot be dealt with the current rules. So in that respect, the question I think is, is legitimately uh, important that, that um, what, are, what kind of new rules do we need? And in my perspective, I would not call this intervention. I would call this that this is an entirely new field of, of possible actions and what can happen, which has never happened before. And so it's clear for this new field, we have no rules. 
And therefore, I think it's legitimate to ask about these new rules and what they should look like. And I know exactly, very diffi difficult if you do not know exactly what will happen, what should be the right rules are, and therefore the, your question about uh, uh, whether do it step by step or, and I think one, I think it's easy to, to, to criticize the AI Act, so I'm not a specialist in this, yeah, but I think, and also the DMA you can easily criticize, it's all past competition cases, and it should be more in the future, but, and also adapting the regulation. I think the point is that, uh, that these acts are, cautious about this is because the legislators, and especially also in, in the EU, the member states, and are cautious of giving the commission too much discretionary scope to change and adapt all these rules themselves. So they would like to have a say on that. So I would interpret more from this institutional perspective that they are cautious because it's entirely clear it has to be adapted and therefore I see all these acts only as a first step to further regulation. And I'm afraid that I'm um, very sure that AI, as we, as we will see it, will end up with high regulation at the end. Perhaps not in the way into the horizontal regulation, very differentiated perhaps, but I think it will be highly regulated at the end. I'm pretty sure about this, whether we like it or not. The question to me would be, how do we do this? I think I can drop my PhD and change to this. I think, <laughs> I think this would need a years of research to answer this one shortly. But I think, and I'm going to make it myself easy maybe, um, I focused on competition. And I do think that competition law has very flexible tools to intervene whenever needed. But of course, with, with generative AI, it touches on so many points that need to be regulated. But I also think we need to be careful not to over-regulate everything. So, okay, for the data, you need to go to the GDPR. For AI, you need to go to the AI Act. But if it's generative AI, we have this new act. And then companies, it's going to be impossible to, to, to comply with, with everything. Um, so I do think that with competition law, we have, um, we have a good system in place that is, that is flexible and adaptive to new technologies. But for specific purposes, I also don't know, actually, maybe the AI Act or GDPR would be enough. It's not something that I've looked into. So maybe someone else. Can I follow? Yeah. Um, so um, I, I think that's a very good question, and it uh, relates to this concept in my mind, um, the dis distinction between individual harms and systemic harms. Because for individual harms, like copyright infringement, okay, IP infringement, um, I don't think we need something completely new. Okay, there are new challenges with each and every technology. We had these challenges with digital te technologies, with the internet, and the, the law adapted itself, whether through case law, by the court decisions, and then when things transpired sometimes by really changes in the law. Um, so, so this problem, I don't want to say will take care of itself, but uh, some, someone will take care of it in, in time the law will transpire and we will better understand if we need something new, but at the moment I don't think we should do some huge overalls in our existing laws. With systemic harms, it's, too, it's, it's more difficult, I think, I believe. And, and I, I think we need to invest more effort in thinking about what we are going to, to lose or what, are, what would be the systemic risk in this disruptive technology. Um, so we already heard about misinformation. In my mind, we may be losing um, diversity in the age of language models. And the, one of the previous versions of the AI Act did have provisions, uh, ob soft obligations, soft law regarding the preservation of cultural diversity. And this was omitted in the final act, for example. But I think this, this would, could have been a good example of new law, if you like, uh, that is required. So we have to invest more effort in these areas and, and there we may be needing something new. I'll take a final question uh, from you, Bill. I'm gonna ask you to make it very short. So two, yeah, three so, words, you know, something like that. So I'm not sure who answers this best, but um, I'm, I'm a real fan of diversity and regulatory policies and um, really have enjoyed the um, back and forth of Europe passes legislation and then the U.S. decides and says, what a stupid idea, but then basically adopts the same sort of goals. When the U.S.
we may be losing that with the you know, elimination of Chevron deference. It's unclear what will happen. It obviously depends on the election. I'm just curious if anybody has a response. It's like, do you expect more of homogenization in the positions? And, and in, in that, will we really lose something in regulation? So it's a great question. And I mean, the, the trends in the US are very interesting. I, I do follow them as well, you know, the Chevron and the uh, West Virginia case and what will happen with all of that. Um, I do think it's a great strength of the American system in technology that there is decentralization of decision making and that that's a feature and definitely not a bug. But it is also a different assumption from what is, you know, institutionally the structure from the treaties to the prior question in Europe, that there is this sort of jealous relationship because of the centralization assumption in the EU model. But the fact is these are global markets. So there will be competition between regulators. I um, mean, you know, I'm based near London, so I'm looking at the new data act that we have coming through Parliament that will at some level deregulate. Brussels will have to respond to that, otherwise the business will flow to the UK. And I think that's just a very healthy dynamic. I don't see why that's always thought to be a harmful race to the bottom. So I'm very sympathetic to the question. All right, I'll move on to the bonus question. I'll stick to one because we are in Germany and we do have to finish on times, all those panels. And then we have a coffee break. Um, and I've made sure to stick to the previous page so they can't, you know, have a look. I'll start with you, Michal. Um, if you could choose the next EU Commissioner for Innovation, who would that be? And I guess why would you choose that person? Okay, so I'm not going to, um, to name a person, but it would be someone who, with a complexity mindset, who understands that in order to handle systemic issues, we need uh, a theory and methods uh, that attend to systems. Um, so, so this is one thing. Um, someone who would pay attention to interconnectedness and uh, someone who would pursue this uh, humble, adaptable, responsive, dynamic uh, regulatory approach. To ask for a name during the coffee break, but it's a great answer. Anouk, um, if you were EU Commissioner for Competition, Me. yes, what is the first thing you would do? Okay. The first thing that I would do, it. Sorry, I'm going to answer this question within my PhD uh, or with my PhD in mind. <laughs> Not necessarily the generative AI, maybe. But maybe, no, maybe it, it, it's also important for generative AI. I, I would make sure that we, if, we, if we're going to analyze mergers, that we also analyze the capabilities of a firm. And for that, I think that for generative AI, it will also be important that if... Um, if a firm, a big firm, acquires a smaller firm that is going to be an important competitor because it has important capabilities, it shouldn't be allowed to, to merge. So I would, I would create a framework that we can take into account these important innovative capabilities. How many management scholars would you hire within the team? Mm, as much as I could get. Okay, good. All right, very last question before the coffee break uh, to you, Stephen. If you were tomorrow at the head of the CMA, different question, uh, which AI leaders from the industry would you get in touch to in order for you to better understand the ecosystem? Well, actually, uh, so I've got to give you a very long symposium because I know you don't want any coffee. Um, this is actually a, a question which already has a precedent. Um, so Sarah Cardell, the CMA chief executive, did go around Silicon Valley in January, and this got picked up a bit on Twitter. She went to a concurrences conference afterwards. And I thought to myself, how does this look if you, you know, from this little island in Northwest Europe, you're going around telling people from these giant Silicon Valley companies how to run their business? So my answer would be with, with care. And I'm not sure that I would actually approach anyone directly. I think I would be traditional and I would exercise legal powers through representatives as one is supposed to. All right. Yeah, very good. Thank you. So